Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah al-Ali al-Wahid al-Alim al-Fard al-Ghani al-Majid wa afadhul al-Salati wa al-Taslim ala al-Nabi al-Mustafa al-Karim wa alihi wa sahbihi al-Athar la siyama rafiquhu fi al-Ghar wa ba'd Inshallah just wait for people to join We will wait one or two minutes, insha'Allah, and then we will start bi'ithnillah. Any brothers or sisters have any questions to do with this topic, problem of evil and suffering, uh, they can kindly, insha'Allah, uh, post their questions in the comments, and insha'Allah I will try to answer them. So in Ramadan, I posted a brief comment regarding the problem of evil and suffering. And several brothers, they asked questions for clarification purposes. This, I thought, is only fair that I give some time uh, to this question. And if there are any questions that brothers have, then inshallah, uh, they can post their questions and I will try to answer them. <clears throat> now the title of the concept, the problem of evil and suffering. Now, I just want to give a brief background on this uh, objection or question. Uh, this question and concept was initially pioneered by Epicurus. Now those that don't know Epicurus, Epicurus was a Greek philosopher who lived between 270 and 341 BC. And uh, he, he, had, he had this riddle. And inside this riddle of his, he posed a question uh, to the believers and theists, those who believe in God. Now, I want to read Epicurus's riddle first, and then, inshallah, from there, uh, we will answer this uh, objection. God, uh, this is a translation of the, the riddle which is in Greek initially. God, says Epicurus, either wishes to prevent evil and is unable, or he is able and is unwilling, or he is neither willing nor able, or he is both willing and able. If he is willing and is unable, he is weak, which does not fit the character of God. If he is able and unwilling, he is malevolent, malevolent meaning evil, which does not fit God's character either. If he is neither willing nor able, he is both malevolent and weak, and therefore not God at all. If he is both willing and able, which alone is fitting for God, from what source then are evils? Why does, not, why does he not prevent evil? So this is Epicurus's riddle, where he is uh, challenging and objecting to the uh, theistic theology of God. And he mainly questions the two uh, characteristics and attributes of Allah. I will use the word God uh, just to keep things easy for now, because we are directly dealing with Epicurus's riddle, because he is a pioneer. And before I move on, there's one thing I want everybody to understand here. <clears throat> a lot of the modern day uh, uh, challenges or uh, concepts that we hear that are leveled against Islam and Islamic theology, they are not really new. They are all old. So even, for example, LGBTQ, homosexuality is not something that is new. 
It was there in the time of Lut alayhi salam. In the same manner, uh, atheism, agnosticism, your pantheism, uh, de deism, fideism, you know, all the isms, they are not new uh, phenomenon, uh, phenomena or new concepts. They are all old. Since shaitan and the devil has been there, uh, these uh, corrupted and deviated ideologies have existed. The only issue is the many of us, uh, and, I'm, and, I'm, and when I say many of us, I'm talking about the Muslims in particular, and our youth especially, we don't read the works of our scholars and ulama. And because of this, uh, at times we come under pressure and we struggle in answering some of these problems. The reality is that these problems, these concepts, they've been tackled, repudiated, refuted, refuted and adequately answered by our ulama. The only thing we have to do is contemporize, contextualize those concepts uh, in modern day context. So now Epicurus' riddle is mainly based on the two, two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All powerful and all good. So Epicurus' argument is that if God is all powerful, omnipotent, qadir, innahu ala kulli shayin qadir, then why does he not remove and alleviate the evil in the world? And if he is all good, that's why uh, one atheist he objected that the Quran from the 140, 114 surahs, 113 they begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate. So ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, they are uh, distinctive uh, qualities and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if Allah is all merciful or all good, then why does he allow evil to take place and suffering? So this is the synopsis and the gist of Epicurus' argument that you've got all powerful and you've got all good or all merciful, uh, very similar meanings. So if God is able uh, to remove and alleviate all their problems and sufferings, why doesn't he? And if he's all good and all merciful, then why does he uh, allow this to happen? In both cases, there's a problem, Epicurus argues. And this uh, concept of the problem of evil and suffering, a lot of Muslims, even today, they come under pressure when they hear these arguments from non-Muslims and atheists in particular. So, <clears throat> inshallah, in the next half an hour or so, I want to uh, systematically scrutinize uh, and criticize this concept based on, inshallah, sound arguments. Number one, the first, most and uh, most important, that the, the entire concept of evil and suffering is based on misrepresentation and false premises. And what do I mean by false premises? Premise is those elements, uh, those sentences in more simple terms, which uh, form an argument. So if a person has an argument and before they reach uh, the conclusion in order to establish the argument or the point and the claim of the argument, the procedure that they take, the steps that they take, those steps and those procedures, uh, they consist of premises. So sentences in, in simple, in, in later, layman term. So the premises, meaning the main structure of this entire argument is based on misrepresentation. And why do I say this? The reason I say this is because as Muslims, especially, we don't believe that Allah is only all merciful and all kind. These are only two of his attributes. Or Allah is all powerful and all merciful. 
we don't believe Allah to be confined in only these two attributes. We believe Allah to have many al asma wa sifat as they're known, the attributes and qualities that have been mentioned in the Quran and Hadith. Allah is also all wise, He's all powerful, He's omnipotent, omniscient. فَعَالُ لِمَا يُرِيدُ He does what He pleases. لا يسأل عما يفعل. Nobody can question Allah for what He does. وهم يسألون. Yes, people will be questioned. So when we look at the attributes of Allah and we study the sifat of Allah, we will know and we'll have this conviction and certitude that Allah does not only have these two attributes. So the first thing we say to an atheist when they come out with this objection, the uh, 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 problem of evil, and suffering is said, number one, that at least it is only fair that we dialogue and we discuss with you is that number one, you represent our God correctly. Number one, you restricted our God into only two attributes. And this is unfair and unjust because we don't believe Allah only to be all merciful and all kind. These are only two of his attributes. So this is number one, very important. And if we stress on this point, from a philosophical perspective, we have actually dismantled the entire argument because the entire argument is based on uh, false uh, premises. They're not, they're not true, they're simply not true. We don't believe God only to be all-powerful and all-merciful, as Epicurus says, or anybody else says that he's all-merciful and all-loving. So that's number one. Number two, there's about five, six points I'm going to mention, inshallah. Hopefully this question, this the, the problem of evil is not a problem. At the end of these, inshallah, you will realize that the problem of evil and suffering is not a problem at all. Number two. Number two, looking at the nature of evil and problem. And I want to specifically concentrate on problem. The atheist or anybody who does not believe in God, they have to... Uh, establish uh, that problems are uh, intrinsically uh, wrong or incorrect or even. What do I mean by this? What I mean by this is that not every problem is bad. Not every problem is bad. Why? Because we testify and we see many problems in our life make us better people. Or make us a better Muslim from Islamic theology, there's no problem at all. Because we believe uh, tests and problems of, uh, they, they come from Allah uh, to, uh, to test a believer. And uh, shahada and testimony will also um, collaborate with this notion that problems, many a times problems make a person a better, uh, a better person. For example, a test comes, a problem comes inside family or in health. Or when, when a person begins to introspect and contemplate in his actions and his life and he, then he tries to rectify himself so he becomes a better Muslim, a better believer or a better human uh, for, that, uh, for that matter. So number two, that atheist has to provide evidence that problems and evils are intrinsically bad and there's no good aspect to it at all which can be proven otherwise easily. So many problems are a means of mercy and a person becomes a better person. So that's number two. Number three. Number three, when an atheist, he objects. The reason he objects because he doesn't understand the wisdom behind evil and problem that why would a merciful and all loving God allow evil and problem happen. So he endeavors to understand the wisdom behind evil and problem. So from an Islamic theology uh, perspective, Islamic theology, uh, theological perspective, we can easily answer this. And the reason we can easily answer this is because in the Quran <clears throat> and in the Ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there have been uh, many uh, Many reasons have, have, have been given by Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for uh, why uh, problems and evil takes place in the world. Number one, tests. 
Allah tests a person's wealth inside his offspring, inside his health, etc. ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس. The Quran is very clear that the corruption that we see on earth, <coughs> the corruption that we see on earth, this is because of people's actions. بما كسبت أيدي الناس. The corruption on earth and sea is because of the actions that people carry out. So there, there is explanation of problems and evil happening in the world. Number, I don't know, what, what number is this? I can't see any questions. Are people asking me questions? Because I don't know. I can't see any questions on the screen. Uh, let me just see if there's any questions. Okay, there's no questions so far. So, yes, so that's number three. Or was it number four? I think it's number three. Number four. Number four point against this argument is that if we take Epicurus' argument that why does God not alleviate and take away the problems and evils in the world despite being omnipotent, then the opposite side of that argument is that if does God have to does God have to uh, alleviate all the problems and evils if God has to then this will make a God and Allah majboor he is compelled and is forced and this is against the nature and the definition of God because God by definition he has he's omnipotent and لما يريد, he does whatever he desires and whatever he wishes Point number five, if God does remove all evil and problems and there is no evil and there's no problem in the world, then where does that leave free will? I mean, people, they commit certain actions through their free will. They choose certain actions because of which problems and evil come about. If there was no evil in the world and there were no problems in the world, then people would not have free will of carrying out those actions. Everybody's actions will be restricted and they will be compelled only to do good. So this goes against the concept of free will, which everybody believes. The theist, the atheist, agnostic, pantheist, everybody believes that people got free will. Why? Because... We see free will, yes, uh, Jabariya, that exception, but I'm talking about uh, in terms of uh, atheism and uh, theism. So that's point number five. So let me just uh, quickly uh, adumbrate these five points in case those brothers and sisters that missed. Number one, that the entire argument of the problem of evil and suffering is based on false uh, premises and is based on a misrepresentation of Allah and God. Because we don't believe God to only be all merciful and all powerful or all loving. He has many attributes and qualities. Number two, uh, the atheist has to establish that problems and evils, all problems are intrinsically bad, which is not the case. There are many examples. Number three, there are reasons given in the Quran and a hadith of why problems and evil uh, occur because of people's actions, because of tests, etc. Number four, point number four was that from an uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic perspective, was it point number four, number five? Khair, anyway, I haven't written these points down, but those brothers that have, they can write them down, inshallah. That from an Islamic uh, theological perspective, uh, if, if we believe uh, Allah, he has to remove all of the problems and evils then this will make him a uh, majboor and compel that forced and this uh, is against the nature and definition of Allah and God and yes and number five is the, uh, the, the, the issue of free will that if it's only good in the world and there's no problems and evils then people uh, would have uh, would not have the choice of committing evil uh, which we clearly uh, see
Now, going to the, the root, or should I say the essence and the pivotal point of the entire argument is, and this is the final point, is okay, we've given, we've demonstrated that the concept of evil and problem uh, is based on false premises. Allah has many attributes, etc. And there are reasons given in the Quran and the Hadith. Uh, but what about those those things and those issues that we don't understand? Like, I mean, etc. That corruption and problems take place because of people's actions. Fine. I do wrong. Yeah. I commit sin and because of which I get penalized, fine, I understand. But what about those problems and what about uh, those issues that uh, we don't understand? So, for example, I'm not sure if, 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 uh, if everybody, can everybody hear me? Looks like it's been cut off. So what about those issues and those things that we don't understand? For example, a five years old kid who dies from cancer. Why does he deserve, why does a five years old child deserve to die from cancer? Or, like Allah Taftadani mentions, Al-Faqir al muadab fi dunya wal akhirah A poor person who is punished in this life and in the year after. The reason he's punished in this life is because he's poor. He doesn't have any money. He doesn't have a, a comfortable life. It's a life of struggle and discomfort. And in the Akhirah, he gets punished because of not having Iman. So how do you explain these cases? Fine, we understand that there are, that there are many evil and problems in the world because of people's actions. That's, that's understood. But there's also a significant portion of problems and evils which we don't understand. Like the child passing away at the age of five, or uh, a poor person who suffers in this world and in the akhirah. So the simple answer to this is <clears throat> that if a person he tries to understand the reasons and the wisdom behind every problem and evil, then this is a tacit and indirect claim of divinity. What do I mean by this? I mean by this that if a, if a human, if he tries to understand the reasons for every problem and evil in the world, then he is indirectly claiming that he is God. Why? Because only Allah and only God is omniscient. He is the only one that has knowledge over everything. Human's understanding, a human's intellect, a human's sagacity is limited, is finite. It cannot comprehend all of the reasons <clears throat> and uh, 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 reasons and uh, and hikam or wisdoms behind all of the problem and evil. So that's number one. So what do we do? We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all wise, is omniscient and fi'lul hakim la yakhru al hikmah as the Arabic proverb says that the action of a wise is not empty and is not void from wisdom. But if an atheist turns around and says, well, this is a cop-out, this explanation is not a good explanation, meaning just to say that Allah or God is all-powerful uh, all and all-wise and omniscient, hence we should just delegate uh, and hand over the wisdom and the reasons for these suffering to Allah. This is not a good explanation. We will retort uh, in, 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 in answer and in our defense that no, this is a good explanation. And the reason this is a good explanation is because delegating uh, to a higher authority, delegating the matter to a higher authority or trusting in a more wise uh, and omniscient uh, being in this, uh, in this scenario, especially, is, is something that everybody does. Meaning, even normal people, day to day, they trust a higher authority. A patient, for example, who goes to the doctor, he has no idea regarding medicine. He has no idea 
and knowledge regarding x-ray scan or anything else he goes to the doctor the doctor uh, diagnoses his illness or her illness and they prescribe a medicine and the patient without any question no ifs and no buts he takes the prescribed medicine and he uh, and he acts upon the doctor's advice even though he doesn't know anything so what has he done he has based his trust in the doctor why because the doctor is more wise when it comes to medicine and everybody does this nobody turns around and you know questions the wisdom of the doctor i mean people might do this but it usually doesn't happen in the same way if an atheist for example is sitting inside a plane 30 uh, 30000 feet high and the pilot makes announcement that a turbulence uh, is coming and it might get very bumpy and rocky so everybody please sit down and fasten your seat belts that atheist who is 30000 feet high doesn't believe in allah or his rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam he will not question the pilot advice even though he doesn't know anything about piloting or turbulence he has delegated the matter to the pilot so what i'm saying in essence is that delegating our matters especially those that we don't understand to a higher authority is something that everybody does the only difference is that atheist does this in, uh, to the creation and we delegate our matters to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is not an cop out is a valid explanation is a sound explanation we believe allah once we've established the existence of allah we have automatically established those qualities and attributes which are wajib for allah meaning which are rationally necessary for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and amongst those qualities and attributes which are rationally necessary for allah is allah being all wise al hakim omniscient omnipotent etc so this is uh, the uh, synopsis of the argument uh, and even in the quran surah al kahf uh, the journey of musa alayhi salatu wassalam and khazir alayhi salam khazir alayhi salam he carried out certain actions which musa alayhi salam did not understand like breaking or making a hole inside the ship of those uh, young orphans the masakin and similarly uh, killing that young child at the end khazir alayhi salam he explained the reasons why he did this so from this we can extract this lesson that there are certain things that happen in the world that we don't understand from uh, the outwards and ostensibly those actions seem uh, irrational and they contradict our logic however the wisdom uh, and the sagacity that is behind uh, those actions allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does know why because allah is al hakim is omniscient and, uh, and all wise so i hope inshallah bi idhnillah uh, this session was beneficial and inshallah it answered the uh, and just 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 to mention the last thing i don't see any questions just to mention one last thing that coming from an uh, epistemological perspective epistemology epistemology is how we uh, gain our knowledge and the sources of knowledge so in uh, philosophy of uh, knowledge in uh, the philosophy of knowledge there is a uh, entire section on epistemology meaning how we uh, derive or how we learn uh, from our uh, sensory experiences from our intellect and how we gain knowledge and what are the sources of knowledge so coming from an uh, epistemological perspective the argument or the 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 concept of the problem of evil and suffering is not an actually a problem and the reason is not a problem because an atheist who does not believe in god uh, uh, who does not believe in god it shouldn't be a problem for them why because they don't believe god exists so it's not a problem and for a theist a, a person who believes in god and allah for them is also not a problem because they believe allah's actions are based on wisdom and there is no uh, problem so coming strictly from uh, an uh, epistemological perspective if we analyze uh, the atheist and the theist and we put the concept in between we will realize that there is no problem because a theist a person who believes in god he believes that god's actions are based on wisdom hence there is no problem and an atheist 
who does not believe in God and who rejects the existence of God, for them is not a problem because there is no God, hence there is no problem of evil. So alhamdulillah, uh, this is a more of an accusative and ilzami response, uh, but is also, uh, is also a response nevertheless. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq uh, to stay steadfast upon Iman, give us death upon Iman, and resurrect uh, us all on the Day of Judgment with Iman and A'mal. Jazakumullahu khayra. Allah khayra. Alhamdulillah.